The purpose of propaganda is to so shape people's perception of reality that even when confronted with a mountain of evidence, they will not change their minds. Welcome to the Elisa Childers Podcast. My guest today has written a provocative and, might I add, best-selling book, and that book is called We Will Not Be Silent, Responding Courageously to Our Culture's Assault on Christianity. Dr. Erwin Lutzer is Pastor Emeritus of the Moody Bible Church, where he served as the senior pastor for 36 years. He's a world-renowned Bible expositor. He's been on radio programs, three radio programs that have been heard on more than a thousand outlets all around the world. And he's authored several books, but the most recent one that we're going to talk about today is written to help equip Christians to live out their convictions in a culture where hostility toward those Christian beliefs is growing. So we live in an outrage culture. We live in a culture of victimhood. We have very real problems like racism and poverty. And Dr. Lutzer's book will help you as a Christian to reject the toxic solutions that culture wants to give you and uh, be genuine in your representation of Christ to a watching world who needs him more than ever. So Dr. Lutzer, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you on with me. It's just, it's a joy. Welcome. Alisa, thank you so much for having me. I've watched some of your previous podcasts and I've always been so impressed by the kind of questions that you ask. So I think we're going to have a good discussion today. Well, I hope so. I hope I don't disappoint. You know, I will try to ask the interesting questions today. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you and I had a chance to meet in person recently, and I got to share with you how your ministry uh, really helped me at a pivotal point point in my life, but I don't think I did get to tell you that there were actually a couple of really pivotal points where a lecture by you or a sermon by you uh, sort of helped shift where I went in life. And so the first one I think I told you about where when my faith was reconstructing, I listened to your lecture about the Oprah Winfrey spirituality and Marianne Wilson and, and the New Age kind of stuff that was coming in. But one thing I think I forgot to tell you, and I don't know if you'll remember this sermon, but a few years years ago, you preached a sermon that had to do with social media, and you you encouraged the listeners to take either, I can't remember if you said to take time off social media or just get off social media, but that so inspired me. I actually deactivated my Facebook account. Now, within 30 days of doing that, I went to a training with our mutual friend, uh, Frank Turek, and that's when I believe the Lord called me to start an uh, online apologetics ministry. And so I... 30 days leading up to that, I had had total radio silence on social media where I just sought the Lord. I, I, And I believe that that was instrumental in even starting this ministry. So thank you for that. Elisa, that is so encouraging to me. And the reason that I preached on social media and the power of technology is because so many people are being led astray. Mm. And, you know, in my book that we're discussing today, We Will Not Be Silenced, You may remember that one of the chapters that talks about the sexualization of children says this, the cell phone in your teenager's hand may do more to inform his or her worldview than an hour of church and an hour of Sunday school. Mm. So when we talk about the culture today, we have to talk about it on multiple fronts. And certainly one of the areas that has to be addressed is technology. Mm. But, uh, Elisa, also I want to say this about your book, Another Gospel. You know, that's really a good book. And let me tell you why. We read so many stories of people who have left the faith. They were evangelical, but now supposedly they had seen the light and they were uh, heading out in a new direction. Yours is the opposite story. You know, you began accepting some of the liberal ideas, some of the woke culture, but then you worked your way back and your story is very inspiring. And also what you do, which is so good, you actually quote what is being said today over against what the scriptures say. And so people begin to understand that 
There are many people here, who, for example, who are into social justice, but it isn't a biblical view of social justice, and we're being led astray. Mm. So thank you for writing that book. Well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, I'm going to isolate that clip and put it up like, he likes my book. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank you. That was very kind. But we're here. We're going to talk about your book today. We will not be silenced. Um, I love this book. I loved this book. I burned. I told you before we came on the air. I burned through this book, and I've written. I've read. Sorry, several books, sort of in this vein, that are on the topic of culture and what's going on. Critical theory, critical race theory, like you mentioned, woke culture, social justice, and your book is unique to me in that I found myself deeply inspired on a personal level to become more courageous in in standing against some of the things that are anti-biblical in our culture, no matter what the cost is for that. And so just for all of our viewers, this is a book you want to get your hands on and you want to read. It will, I do believe it will inspire you. And so as we get into this conversation about this book, uh, I want to read an excerpt. This is just a paragraph from your book because I think it sums up so much the felt problem. When, when Christians, when we open up our social media news feeds, when we watch movies, when we watch TV, this is what we're being confronted with. And this is what we're being confused by. This is what we're sort of being attempting to be shamed into silence over. And so this is what you say in your book. Take a moment and reflect on what has happened in America over the last 20 years. Consider the increasingly sexually explicit curriculum in our public schools. Listen to the racial rhetoric of the self-appointed social justice warriors who are committed to inflaming racial division. Look at new laws forcing Christian colleges to compromise their biblical stance about marriage and surrender to the LGBTQ agenda. Uh, and you go on to say that we who are Christians are told that if we want to be known as good citizens, we should keep our antiquated views to ourselves. We're made to feel embarrassed about defending traditional marriage and a sane understanding of gender. Like a deer caught in the headlights, we don't quite know what to do. And whether we are willing to pay the price of fidelity to Scripture, we are shamed into silence. That is a really powerful uh, beginning. That's, I think, in the just maybe one of the first chapters of the introduction, and I think it strikes to the heart of what so many Christians recognize in culture and are feeling. Now, you're retired. You know, you, you've you had this long and fruitful pastoral ministry, radio ministry. Why on earth would you want to write a controversial book like this? Um, what, what do you think caused you to write this book? Elisa, I think it was when I began to realize that the radical left in America does not believe that America can be fixed. Mm. They believe it has to be destroyed and rebuilt on a quasi-Marxist foundation. Now, it's very important for us to realize that there is a difference between classical Marxism, which primarily had to do with economics, and of course it caused the big revolutions in Russia and China, Cultural Marxism says we can achieve the very same goals if we do so incrementally, if we are able to capture the media and education and, uh, of course, such things as laws and vote for the right people, we can bring about a Marxist state and people will like it because they will see its benefits. Now, once I understood that, I began to realize, and as you know, this book shows how that explains a lot of things in society. It explains the vilification of our history. Why is it that, uh, you know, monuments are toppled and, of course, we have the uh, criticism of, Islam, of uh, America's beginnings. We have all those things. We have the 1619 Project which really is intended to embarrass America and to make sure that everybody realizes how really awful we really are. So once you begin to understand that, you understand how racism is used. By the way, Arthur Schlesinger, who was, in an, who was a, an um, advisor to President Kennedy, said that history is to a nation what memory is to a person. So Elisa, Here's the thing, when a person loses his memory, he doesn't know who he is, mm. and he becomes whatever people say that he is. So they want us to lose our collective memories so that they can build upon a different foundation. And by the way, while I'm on the topic, 
The family was a unit of oppression to Karl Marx, because remember in Marxism, it's all about taking away people's oppression. And his idea was that uh, men oppress their wives, children are oppressed by their parents. God is the ultimate oppressor when they go to church, take away their oppression. Isn't it interesting that black lives matter? And of course, we know that all black lives matter. But isn't it interesting that on their website, they said that they believe in the disillusion of the American family, the nuclear family. Why? Because Marxism says it's a unit of oppression. But now let me hurry on. Then what I do is I apply this to the issue of race. And this is so critical. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to explore it in more detail. But this is absolutely incredibly important that Saul Alinsky, a community worker here in Chicago, who is a Marxist, realized that he could apply Marxism to race to keep the races in perpetual conflict. He used to tell those who worked with him, don't solve problems, use them. And so what I show is that critical race theory and so forth is intended deliberately to keep the races in antagonism and conflict. And as you know, in our society, it's working very beautifully. Mm -hmm. And we can also talk about how the Church of Jesus Christ actually has an answer for that. But the point is very quickly that the oppressed should eventually have cultural dominance over the oppressors. And the only way to do that is to continue to keep the pot boiling, so to speak, and to keep the antagonism there. And then I apply it to, um, to freedom of speech. Marcuse, who was a Marxist in the 60s, I'm old enough to remember when he lived. I know that you, Elisa, weren't born at that time. But he taught that it is very important that we not have freedom of speech because capitalists, the oppressors, will always win. So what we have to do is to make sure that the oppressors are not allowed to speak and only the oppressed. Well, you can see how that flows, of course, into society. And uh, therefore, conservatives who are the oppressors are oftentimes not allowed to speak in our universities. And by the way, while I'm at it, students are told that if you hear something you don't agree with or something that offends you, you have to go to a safe place. It's called safism, where you can lick the wounds of your unappreciated victimhood. And then I know you want to talk about propaganda. That's a chapter in my book, and I'll give you the opportunity to ask questions about that. And so I apply it to the family. One of the largest, longest chapters in my book has to do with socialism. So here's the key. Once I began to realize that cultural Marxism was being driven through our universities, to our students, to the elite, everything began to fall into line. But one other footnote before you go on to your questions, as you know, in every chapter of my book, I always have a response of the church because that's where my heart is. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do we as Christians respond to this culture that clearly has lost its way? Mm. Well, there's so much there, and I can't wait to dig deeper into some of these questions. And one thing I appreciate about your book is how you so carefully define that phrase, cultural Marxism, because sometimes in social media culture where everybody's triggered all the time and they're throwing out all kinds of phrases without really defining them, uh, cultural Marxism is one of those phrases that people can reject saying, well, hey, that's you're just, you're just using that to apply that to everybody who disagrees agrees with you or anybody who might bring up some kind of justice issue. You're just slapping the label cultural Marxist onto them. But you do carefully define that in your book, and you just hinted at it a moment ago, but I wonder if just as, to lay the foundation for this conversation, if you could just give us a really solid definition of what cultural Marxism is and what, and what it's seeking to accomplish. Cultural Marxism basically is, to, is seeking to accomplish statism, big government, socialism. In other words, it is transferring responsibilities from the individual to the state. And this becomes very, very critical. 
And in the midst of it, if I might uh, emphasize, Elisa, uh, the reason that it is so attractive is because of the words that it uses. For example, let's talk about the word equality. That's a mm. wonderful word. We all seek equality. But today you have marriage equality, which is same-sex marriage. You have income equality, which of course is socialism. You have uh, reproductive health care equality or justice. That's another word that is used. So you have environmental justice. Well, who can be against equality and justice? But these words are defined in such a way that they are actually destructive and even evil. And certainly, if, that, if the Equality Act were passed, we'd see that even more clearly. So cultural Marxism says we have to do away with individualism. We have to think in terms of groups. So either you're an oppressor or you are the oppressed. And once you're in that group, you, in effect, stay there. Because what we are after is group liberation. No room for individualism. No room for the opportunity of even reconciliation or forgiveness. You are a part of the right group or you're a part of the wrong group. Just to put another word in there regarding critical race theory, if you are white, even if you were born in the poorest area imaginable, you would be considered to be a person of privilege. Whereas an African-American who's made millions of dollars, maybe LeBron James, he would not be a person of privilege because of the color of his skin. Now, Elisa, it's so important for people to realize that this is totally contrary to what Martin Luther King taught. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King said, Let's not judge one another by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And that, of course, is vilified today yeah. in favor of group identity, which cultural Marxism maximizes to its advantage. One of the sections of your book that was particularly powerful to me was the part about the family and how Marxism sort of seeks to dismantle the family. I think when a lot of people found out that that was on the Black Lives Matter website, I think a lot of Christians were scratching their heads like, why would that be an issue for Marxists? And you hinted at it. I wonder if you could elaborate on that, because I found that to be really powerful. And I've actually seen this even in some progressive Christian circles, I, I remember watching a video by a progressive Christian children's pastor who was advocating for uh, the liberation of children in the sense that they're uh, to liberate their voices, to liberate, you know, parents need to stop telling kids what to do in this way and that way. And I, I noticed that even there was this sort of like children are oppressed in in the view of this progressive children's pastor. Help us understand why that's the case. Maybe elaborate on that. Why would that be such an important thing to a Marxist organization? Well, that would be very important for several reasons. First of all, Lenin especially taught about the need for women to work outside the home so that the state could raise the children. And we have an administration right now in Washington that would advocate those kinds of theories. But here's the point why. First of all, women have, mothers have to become part of the means of production because economics is the only thing that really matters. But furthermore, then the state can educate the children regarding the errors of creationism, belief in God, and all of those other kinds of evils. And they have to be liberated. Now, You've gotten me into something where I could talk about, that I could talk about for quite a while, so I'll try to summarize this. <laughs> when you go through history and you discover, for example, Freud, who basically believed that all sexual restraint is wrong, people should be allowed to live out whatever their urges are, and uh, if you say otherwise, you're oppressive, you can see here, Elisa, that Karl Marx and Freud have met. So that's why the whole sexual issue is so politicized. Whoever that progressive person was that talked about the liberation of children, well, sure, 
if they are being oppressed or if they are being abused, let's liberate them. Yeah. But if you're saying that children should not be raised with guidelines, with laws, with expectations, if you're saying that, you are simply asking for trouble. And, oh, this is so exciting to me because it makes it, un- it helps us to understand almost everything. The real issue here is human nature. See, Marx believed that the only reason why people do evil is because of oppression, external oppression. Take away the oppression, and they are just going to be wonderful citizens. Defund the police, let, uh, let them out of jail, which is oppressive, and they're going to turn out to be very wonderful people. Christianity says no, because it is true that external oppression can lead to evil, but the evil exists in every human heart. And therefore, our problems are not just external oppression. The problem with a child is not that he is oppressed because his parents have certain laws or certain rules. The problem is that evil itself is in every one of us. And Solzhenitsyn said so wisely that the line between good and evil does not run between races or cultures. It goes through every human heart. And that's why the Bible talks about the need for children to obey their parents. That's why it's so important. And then I can't help but quote, as you know, I've written also a book about Hitler and the Third Reich. So I must quote Hitler. He who controls the youth controls the future. And by the way, he said in effect to parents, you be sure to clothe the child, feed the child, but the heart of the child will belong to the Reich. It'll belong to the Third Reich. So that's the kind of battle we are in. Christian parents are being told, feed the child, clothe the child, but we want the heart of the child to believe to uh, be uh, held and controlled by a secular culture. You give a detailed account of several different times in history when Marxism was tried and why that didn't work, um, and yet people still keep wanting to try it. Why do you think it's so attractive to people? Why is the whole idea of socialism and Marxism so attractive, especially now? Well, imagine free college, free health care, everything is free. I mean, that really is attractive. And furthermore, a guaranteed income, yes. So it doesn't matter whether or not you work because Marxism basically separates work from profit. Oh, let, let, me, let me get on to a subject here, Elisa. One of the things that you find about socialism, which of course, again, is statism, In a socialistic society, you do not own your money. The state does, and then it apportions it in accordance with fairness. Rebecca and I were in uh, Russia in the mid-1980s, and uh, we discovered that doctors in a hospital were not paid a whole lot more than other workers in the hospital because, after all, the state wanted to do things fairly. Well, you can imagine, of course, that in that particular context, there were not a whole lot of doctors. This idea that the state can take money, this is why socialists always talk about dividing funds, but they never talk about creating wealth because the only way a socialist state can create wealth is for the government to print it. And we certainly seem to be on our way doing that. That's the only way that you can really Well, for example, if I had a pie here, I might cut it up very equally for everybody. But uh, when the pie is gone, the pie is gone. Socialism, of course, rewards laziness. It is opposed to innovation. It is opposed to all that. And yet, very attractive. One other comment, there was a kibbutz in Israel that decided to get run according to socialistic principles. And... um, They discovered that people would bring their dogs into the dining room. They left on lights that they didn't need. Why? Because it's all free. Mm -hmm. And they ended up by saying it became a paradise for parasites. Maybe Churchill said it best 
the great vice of capitalism is the unequal distribution of blessings. The great benefit of socialism is the equal distribution of misery. Mm. Now, lest anybody think we're just going political here and, and, you know, what does this have to do with Christianity as far as, you know, how Christians vote or what, you know, what we think the role of America plays or things like that? Why is this message so important to Christians? It's important for this reason. I point out in my book that Christians have had to live under all kinds of economic systems always unfair economic systems, because in a fallen world, all systems are unfair, even capitalism. But the point that to be made is this, why is this important? Elisa, do you realize, and you know, I came from Canada, but now I I am a naturalized American citizen. Why is it so important? You travel around the world, whether it's India, whether it's Africa, Central America, South America, and you'll find that almost all Christian ministries are supported by American funds. Americans give $400 billion a year to charity. And you know, it can be self-serving to talk about the fact that we need to maintain capitalism over against socialism, which we know would destroy the economy. And maybe it is self-serving, but my heart also breaks for all these ministries around the world that would suffer greatly if they no longer had American funds. So it's not as if America is perfect. God knows we're far from perfect, and we always will be. Perfection awaits heaven, as all of us know, and the kingdom. So it's not that. It's that God has indeed blessed America, And by the way, if we get back to the topic of racism, I have a challenge for your listeners, and that is to find another country that is less racially inclined than America. It has to be a country that is a democracy, that has large segments of different ethnicities. You find it. But anyway, bottom line, yes, of course the church can survive without capitalism, And the church can survive without our constitution. It's built on Jesus, not the American constitution. But at the same time, what an impact for good Mm. the church of Jesus Christ has had here in America that has touched the whole world. Now, I want to ask you a question, um, probably a bit of a controversial question. But, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about Christian nationalism, that phrase. That's kind of one of those phrases that gets thrown ar- around a lot and gets defined in different ways. Um, every What you're describing, uh, what would you say is the difference between that and what I know you're concerned by also, which would be Christian nationalism? Can you pull those things apart and tell us what the difference is between standing for biblical truth, in, you know, to maybe even preserve some of these values that you rightly point out, put so many funds out into the rest of the world for good and to do do good. What's the difference between that and then maybe what we're seeing this emergence of this Christian nationalism? An excellent question. And I would say that the difference is this, is the difference between patriotism and nationalism. Nationalism so identifies Christianity, Christian nationalism, so identifies Christianity with a nation that it believes that ultimately uh, Christianity stands and falls with this nation, which of course is not true because I've already mentioned Christianity has had to survive all kinds of different regimes and economic things, but Christian nationalism is best exemplified really in um, uh, Nazi Germany. Mm. I have, uh, somebody gave me a belt buckle of a Nazi soldier, and on that buckle, there is a Christian cross. So the point is, that is Christian nationalism, where the country becomes really even more important than Christianity, and where you, you so identify your cause as being right because it's tied to the cross, that you're willing even to commit atrocities. Mm. I think maybe we saw this in January 6th, where you had the riot in the Capitol, where people were saying, you know, Jesus is my savior, but Trump is my president. 
That's Christian nationalism. But here's the point. What the media sometimes wants to do is to take all patriots, people who want to honor America on the 4th of July, and call all of them nationalists. And I say that while the line between them sometimes may be a little unclear, there is a difference between being patriotic and being a Christian nationalist. Patriots criticize their country when it needs it. Mm. They stand again, they stand with the good, but they also criticize the bad. They are not beholden to the country. Christian nationalists say, in effect, my country, uh, you know, I uh, right or wrong, this is where I stand. So that, I think, would be the difference. That's very clarifying, even as I kind of think through this this whole topic as well. And you brought up the Nazis, and I think many people hear about some of the atrocities of Hitler's Germany and around the time of World War II, and they have a bit of a disconnect over how all of that got started. And in your book, you write this, uh, you write, quote, revolutions begin with a cultural moment, a pretext that will hide the real agenda to justify the revolution. You need, number one, the triumph of an ideology over science, reason, and civil liberties, and then two, recruit people who are willing to advance the revolution of anarchy in the name of justice and equality. Uh, that is a powerful statement, very helpful to understanding what happened there. Can you explain how Hitler went about doing all of this? And, you know, if that would compare with maybe some of the things you see in current events. You noted there was a woman who lived through that who said to you, you Americans will never understand the euphoria that uh, Hitler created. Elaborate on that a bit, if you would. Oh, I'm glad to elaborate on that. Here's the point. When the Reichstag burned in 1933, and, I, and it is believed, you know, that Hitler had it burned, a man by the name of Martin van der Lubbe, apparently went into that big building there in Berlin, where I have been a couple of times, and he lit it. Hitler said, communism is coming. I'm going to make a bargain with the people. I'm going to take away your personal freedoms. I'm going to take away freedom of assembly. I'm going to take away freedom of speech. But in return, I will keep you safe. And the Germans were willing to go along with that bargain because to be safe, seem to be more important than giving up freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and so forth. Now, I don't want to be sensational here, but I'm wondering if the 6th of January could bring about the same kind of a response where we're taking away your ability to say what you want, you are being deplatformed, and and so forth, but we're doing this, we're getting rid of disinformation to keep you safe, we're getting rid of disinformation about the coronavirus to keep you healthy, and we always have all of you in mind, and therefore what we have is, of course, a pretext for taking away our freedoms. And, uh, Elisa, I can't let you go, and I hope that this uh, talk can go on for quite a while, without talking about the fact that there is, in Nazism, and in the radical left in America, what can be best called a collective demonization. Mm. Collective demonization says this, once you are deplatformed, everyone else has to chime in. If the all-star game is to be moved away from uh, Georgia, uh, everybody else, Coca-Cola, you know, whatever, all have to chime in to show that they are on board. And... Uh, I quote someone there in my book, a woman from Russia who says, it's as if Americans don't, Americans don't understand what is happening. Because in Russia, when someone was deplatformed, everyone else chimed in, as I already emphasized, so that they could show that they were on board. But not only collective demonization, collective guilt. And this relates also to the racial issues. We are constantly told we have not owned our past. Why, that's a controversial statement. What does it mean to own your past? Is it enough to acknowledge it? What does it mean to own it? So somehow we become guilty for things that other people did. 
and that also can become very dangerous. But back to your point, what we need to do as Christians and as a church is to not be co-opted by the left with false theories of social justice and so forth, nor should we be co-opted by what we could call the right, namely political candidates, political parties. We have to stick with the issues. We have to be biblical but at the, without compromising truth, but at the same time recognize that um, we have a unifying message here that the world needs to hear. I need to add this because it's so critical. I know we raised the issue of race some time ago in this discussion. Instead of critical race theory, just think of the message of the church. The church said there aren't that many differences between us. We are all created in the image of God. We are all sinners. We all need Christ as our Savior. We can come together and uh, we meet at the foot of the cross. At the, at the Lord's table, we don't have black spaces and white spaces and brown spaces. We are all one in Christ. And then we ask ourselves, what can we do together to make things better? In other words, Christianity says we really don't have a skin problem. We have a sin problem, and that's the issue that needs to be dealt with that is totally overlooked in our society today. In our society today, people are asking themselves, am I woke enough to be seen as virtuous? You are evil, but I am woke. The evils that exist in you would never exist in me, and so that alienates society and it keeps splintering us as a nation and as a country. And in the midst of this, the church must speak. Mm. Amen to that. In fact, it reminds me of a comment I saw from a lady who had been totally indoctrinated with critical theory in college, and she wrote, I once was woke, but now I'm free. And I thought that was quite powerful. Yeah. Several times Very in your good. book, you reference uh, George Orwell and his famous book, 1984. And I remember reading this in the 10th grade, found it to be utterly fascinating. But at the same time, I also found it to be kind of fantastical in the sense that I remember thinking, this could never happen here, right? The whole 1984 paradigm could never uh, happen. I specifically remember thinking that you could never convince that many people to go along with something that just so makes no sense. Um, yet we've seen it happen. In fact, I would argue that we're currently seeing it happen in America with the acceptance of abortion. We, we, we slaughter so many innocent children every single day, and it's not only approved of, but it's considered an issue of justice, like you mentioned, reproductive justice. And I want to specifically ask you about the concept of newspeak that Orwell talked about in his book, which is something you bring out in your book. It's one of the tactics of Big Brother in, in the book 1984. And so, so how proper propaganda and language are being used to bring about a deconstruction of morality and common decency. I uh, wonder if you could comment on that whole idea of propaganda and newspeak, how words have different definitions, and sometimes that happens without people even realizing it. First of all, I want to comment on the introduction that you gave to your question. You said, you know, in the 10th grade, you thought it could never happen here. What the left says is, it could never happen here but when it does, you bigots deserve it, okay? <laughs> of course it's happening here. And language is always used. And by the way, Orwell wrote another book, it's much shorter, on the whole topic of language and political discourse, where he shows that the important thing for politicians is confusion. Why do you think it's so important for us to remember all the pronouns? You know, uh, he's Bert at home, but in school he's supposed to be Bertha. And I don't want to be called I. I want to be called, uh, I don't want to be called he, I want to be called they, and so forth. Who in the world can keep all of this in mind? The answer is we can't, and we're not supposed to. We're supposed to be intimidated mm. so that we don't speak. Yes. And we keep our mouth shut because we don't know what in the world to say or what pronouns to say. But furthermore, you raised another excellent issue, and that had to do with abortion and language and so forth. I'd like to go back to Hitler. 
And the reason I do that is because I wrote a book about him, but also because of the fact that his view of propaganda was used by the radical left. Because Hitler said that with the right use of propaganda, you can make heaven appear like hell and hell appear like heaven. So how does propaganda work? And here's to your answer, uh, Elisa, in response to the question that you asked. How does propaganda work? You use words to camouflage evil. For example, when Hitler starved children, he called it putting them on a low-calorie diet. When uh, Hitler killed Jews, he called it the cleansing of the land. We need to cleanse the land. So what you do is you call something what it really isn't, and we've already, I think, mentioned a couple of times, abortion, reproductive rights, or you know the termination of a fetus. Nobody has the nerve to say, I believe in a mother's right to kill her preborn infant. You don't, you don't hear yeah. that kind of clarity. It always has to be cloaked in language. And that's, of course, exactly what happens. And you're probably acquainted with what gaslighting means, where you actually try to get people to accept a reality that is an alternate reality, that is contrary to biology, that is contrary to common sense. But you do everything you can to try to get them to accept it. Remember, if I've not said this yet, the purpose of propaganda is to so shape people's perception of reality that even when confronted with a mountain of evidence, they will not change their minds. And the way you do it is you do it with words, you give new meanings to words. It's George Orwell's news speak. And you know, where you have, uh, you know, war is peace and all those other contradictions. And then what you do is you put that on a suspecting and oftentimes gullible population and people begin to believe, they begin to believe absurdities. You bring out some very interesting observations about the pandemic in your book. And I want to I want to give a quote here. You said, government assurances are designed to create a dependency on the state that is essential for Marxism to thrive. Here in America, a boost to such dependency took place when trillions of dollars were created electronically for the massive government bailouts in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, now, this was written several months ago, uh, and you said going forward, we can expect calls for more government intervention, more government control, increased redistribution of resources. Um, and and I'm, I'm curious if you can comment on that a little bit, because that was very eye-opening to me when I was reading about in Marxist societies how they would just print money. And that you, I think you you used was it Venezuela as an example, or was it Ecuador, where they they just printed money, and it caused the collapse of the of the economy. It was great for a few a little while, and then it, it caused the collapse. And then you you pointed out that even in the pandemic, they were electronically creating these these funds. Can you comment on that a little bit? Well, you know when the pandemic was happening, and I think that there was a one point. Nine trillion dollar buyout. We might justify that because there were so many businesses that were shut down. But it is so important, Elisa, for your viewers and all who are listening to understand this. Wherever government funds go, government control goes with it. That's why you have lawsuits today regarding the role of the government, even regarding Christian schools, whether or not they can hold their Christian convictions and their students can still get government loans and so forth. That's a whole developing story that's taking place even when we speak. Because wherever the government's hand goes, the government's fist goes, and it insists on control. So, Absolutely, the government wants us dependent. They want us to be totally dependent upon them because then we will know how much we really need the government and um, all of us will recognize that we can't do without the government because the government, to exaggerate perhaps only slightly, takes the place of God. It says, I will be with you when you are born. I'll be with you in your education. I'll be with you even if you don't work, you're going to get paid. I'll be with you all the way to your death. Depend on me. 
the more government dependency that you have, the greater the lurch to socialism. As a matter of fact, I think that's the word I use in the book is the lurch towards socialism. So we can expect that. And uh, certainly with the present government that we have in Washington, the prediction that I made that you just read, I think is coming true because money can now be created electronically. Mm. You know, you just move some decimal points on a computer and there it is. And then you hook that up with uh, cashless society where everything then is credit card and cash. And well, I think you can see where all of this is going to end up. It'll eventually at some point end up in Revelation chapter 13. Yeah. You wrote this as of this writing, there is no cure for COVID-19, so we must wait and see what happens when a vaccine is found. Will it be mandated? Will will our personal information uh, stored in massive databases? We will have to wait and see. Well, here we are with a vaccine now. I wonder what you might add to that with the just what we've learned in the last few months. Would What would you add or uh, edit in that uh, statement there? Well, I think also in the book, I think it's probably close to where you were reading, I quote the um, health department, the World Health Organization, saying we would like to have a digital certificate for every human being. And that digital certificate would control would have a lot of information. And then it says, if we find something nefarious, now that's my word. I don't know what word they used. I didn't memorize it. But if we find something nefarious, we'll be able to delete them. And you and I know you can't argue with a computer, can you? If you're deleted, you are deleted. You won't be able to do business and so forth. Now, isn't it interesting that at this point, while we're having this discussion, the federal government has said we will not demand these COVID passports, but individual businesses are, airlines are, And so what you're going to find is more and more and more control. Because remember, it's all about control. It always has been. And wherever the government can exercise control, if it has socialistic leanings, I can assure you that control will be exercised. Yeah, and I just want to draw our viewers' attention back to the point that when we're talking about socialism, when we're talking about Marxism, you know, Dr. Lutzer and I are not just having a political discussion here. As you, if you've watched my interview with uh, Rod Dreher, one thing that came out of that discussion is that we learned, of course, Marxism, socialism, always comes for the Christians, because ideologically they are so opposed. And this cultural Marxism, this socialism emerges in in effect as a new religion. And I just want to urge our our viewers and our listeners to go back and listen to that uh, that, uh, interview to get a bigger picture of that. We're not just talking politics here. This is ideologies that are a threat to the actual gospel. They're a threat to not just a Christian way of life or how we feel comfortable living. These, these, uh, you you brought out in your book even, I believe it might have been from Russia, where the state had so much control that Christian parents uh, were told that if they evangelized their children and the state found out about it, the children would be taken away from them and they would have no option to have any contact uh, with their children. And I think this is this is what we have to understand as Christians. This isn't a political discussion. This is about a threat to the actual gospel and the spread of the gospel. And uh, you mentioned this herd instinct. That con- that sort of comes into play with all of these ideas, and you you sort of pointed out some of the hypocrisy we saw uh, during the early stages of the pandemic and the race riots of 2020. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean by herd instinct and how we saw that play out in that scenario? Well, we certainly saw herd instinct during the days of COVID and uh, where everyone was supposed to get in line, everyone was supposed to wear a mask. Now, I'm not a doctor, but there is some dispute about these things, but you are not allowed to dispute it because you are supposed to go with the herd. And standing against the herd is very, very difficult. You know that, um, and then of course, 
You have that exception where 1,200 doctors signed on and said during the demonstrations of Black Lives Matter, they don't have to wear masks because uh, their cause is even more important than life itself. So what you have is this idea of herd instinct, which is part of the propaganda piece. Woe to those who do not go along with that agenda. And that's where we are now. Here's the thing that we have to learn, and you already hinted at this, Elisa. I point out in my book, We'll Not Be Silenced, which of course is what we're talking about, the fact that we as Christians have to relearn lessons that previous centuries have learned. If you look throughout church history, this idea of freedom of religion that we have here in America is an anomaly. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the first century, you had Rome, of course, burning Christians who wouldn't confess that Caesar was Lord. Throughout the Middle Ages, there was no freedom of religion. When Luther stood at the Diet of Orms and said, um, I cannot and I will not recant, so help me God, he was supposed to be put to death. Now, he wasn't for some very interesting reasons. But the point is, there was no freedom of religion. And so what we need to do is to realize and this is hard for me to say, but it must be said, it is not necessary to have freedom of religion to be faithful. All that you need to do is to ask the martyrs. And I also like to encourage believers by saying it is not necessary to win on earth in order to win in heaven. That's a good word, and we are going to continue this conversation in our Patreon-only uh, supporter portion of the of the interview and if you're watching this and you want to see that extra episode that bonus content that we offer you can go to patreon.com slash alisa childers and you're going to find different tiers of support where you can get access to a monthly ministry update video you can get access to a facebook page you can get early access to interviews just like this one and you can also get access to the bonus content which we're going to continue here with Dr. Lutzer in just a moment, but uh, I want to ask you as we close out this portion of the interview, I always like to leave our viewers with some hope. We've talked about some really heavy topics. We've gone through some very controversial topics. Um, what sort of hope you, you mentioned, and, and this was such a, a beautiful part of the book, was the church's response even with prayers and things um, in your book. What word of hope would you leave our viewers with? Uh, these are largely going to be Christians watching this. What can we do to, to not be shamed into silence? How can we find the courage within ourselves to speak truth, no matter what the cost, you know, to not just join with the herd? And I'm not just talking about things that have to do with med medical issues, but just when, when even the rubber really meets the road of, of biblical principles, uh, being compromised, how can we find that courage? And what, what word of encouragement and hope would you leave us with today? You know, the last chapter of my book, as you know, is entitled The Words of Jesus to the Church at Sardis, Strengthen What Remains. Jesus said that the church thought that it was alive, but actually it's dead, which is very interesting. Jesus comes to different conclusions that many of our church <laughs> consultants, I'm sure, comes to. But here's the point. Jesus said, repent, but this is directly now related as an answer to your question. Jesus said, but there are still some names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So as we end this section, I want to say to all those of you, and oftentimes I'm asked this question, what about, uh, I'm in a church that's dead. They're unaware of these issues. They live in their bubble. Well, Jesus is saying that he is calling out people, even in those kinds of churches, who are not going to be co-opted by the world, who are going to live out their faith, and who are going to consider opposition from the world as a badge of honor. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. We have to learn that. We have to learn what Bonhoeffer said, that, you know, carrying the cross into the world 
seems like a marvelous idea until you discover where the cross led Christ, namely to Golgotha. Here's what we need to do, Elisa. We need to rethink our witness and be willing to stand for truth individually, corporately, and take the consequences and not feel sorry for ourselves. Jesus said, this has been going on since time immemorial, so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. And so we have to take our place with others. And so there's so much else I could say about responsibilities within the church and to the country, but I just want to leave this word with you. Be encouraged from the words of Jesus. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So it's all about what Jesus thinks, not about what society thinks. It's not what social media thinks. Take the heat and do so joyfully. I love it. Take the heat and do so joyfully. We'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for watching today. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Make sure you click that bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. If you're listening to this podcast on an audio platform like iTunes or Spotify or Google, please leave us a great review. It really helps to get the word out. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.